If you would like to follow along with our reading, then please look at the list on the screen now. It'll show you all the books we intend to read for the next three episodes. Thank you and enjoy the podcast. Y'all ain't ready for this conversation. Welcome back to Whiskey and Words. Tonight's episode, we travel back to the 18th century to unravel Voltaire's seminal classic, Candide. A novel that sparked as much controversy as it did praise. Jolie de Fleuret, Advocate General to the Parisian Parliament at the time of publication, decreed it contrary to religion and morals, whilst the local newspaper heralded it a cultural phenomenon. Accompanying tonight's book, is the single Scotch malt Tamnavillan, distilled in the heart of Speyside, Scotland. I hope you enjoy the show. Okay, welcome back. Uh, how is everyone? Yeah, very dandy. Well. That's yeah. good. Uh, so let's settle in for tonight's episode. Uh, we'll start uh, the proceedings with uh, Matthew's quick review of tonight's whiskey. Okay, so tonight we're drinking a whiskey called Tamnavillan. And this whiskey is from the north northeast Scotland, uh, from the Speyside area. Have a quick taste and tell me what you think. We've actually bought new little whiskey glasses, so oh, yeah. we can now Very kind of sophisticated. We can now spin the whiskey. So, so yeah. What, what, what's the what's the purpose? Of the I shape. Do, I what's, don't. What's I have logic? no clue. They just look pretty, <laughs> <laughs> and then you know I can kind of spin them. So uh, okay, let's let's taste this bad boy. Mm. You, you drink it straight good. from the bottle, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why you're holding it close well, it's, like it's, a baby? It's, it's so good that actually I want to keep it close to me. It is yeah. quite nice, actually. It is. It's easy. It's mm. very easy. Okay, tell me what, what sort of flavours you're tasting. First of all, yourself, Luke. I'm picking up a bit of vanilla. Vanilla, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I detect it's probably definitely not vanilla now, isn't it? That both of us detect it. But, uh, sweet, maybe some fruits... I'm, yeah, I'm going to go for some fruity flavours in there. I was going to go citrus. Uh, Ooh, with I like that, yeah. So haven't, you... haven't you read the back of the bottle? Though? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a little unfair? <laughs> I try to avoid reading as much as possible. <laughs> okay. I think they're words with three syllables, so it should, should be okay. <laughs> yeah. The title of this nearly screwed me over. Okay, so the description for this is a... What, what's, the, what's the nose? Is it... Then I'm always so bad with the nose. No, I know, I, I know. Okay, I can pick guys, up stuff on the taste. But... Have a little, uh, have a little smell. Tell me what your noses are detecting. Oh, honestly, my sense of smell is terrible. Yeah, I, can't, I can barely smell anything. I really wouldn't say that in these times. <laughs> <laughs> also, can't taste it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just tastes like water. Oh my God, am I sweating profusely? <laughs> um, yeah. N- I mean, maybe sweetness. I detect a bit of kind of yeah, a you're close. of sweetness. You're very close to two of the descriptions here with sweetness. Ooh, okay. There's not much peat. There's no peat in this. I don't. I don't really detect any any eminent of sulphur. Honey canned stoned <laughs> fruits. Uh, classic. <laughs> okay. Ten points to Gryffindor. <laughs> <laughs> Let me put you out your misery. Uh, a rich. Warm aroma of apple, toffee, and honey. Okay, so the, yeah. toffee and honey, sweet. Yeah. With a sweet marzipan, I didn't detect the almonds at all, and subtle tangy marmalade notes. Marmalade notes. That's that's a new but new one for the diction. This it's one... basically all the sweetest things that you can find in in a, a confectionery out, outlet, isn't it? Really. Yeah. Yeah. We've got honey. We've got marzipan. We've got what, what was the other one? Uh, oh, toffee. Yeah, toffee. Uh, That's it. marmalade. Yeah, it's, it's like going into your grand's kitchen, isn't it? And getting the stereotypical yeah. old sweet things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a bit of lemon sherbet <laughs> and, and custard cream in there. Uh, and now I really sponge. maybe a bourbon. <laughs> now to really to te- uh, test your whiskey diction, what colour is this? Because it tells me the colour here. Interesting. I mean, oh. I mean, it looks a golden rose apple. 
It looks okay, kind of gold. You're right. Co- coffee. You know what's it? Um, golden syrup. You know the the syrup that uh, you get. Yeah, yeah. I would give it kind of a golden hue with a tinge of yellow. Well, you're both idiots. It's amber gold. Okay, now oh, tra- God. remind yourselves of the taste. Remind me again what you said for the tastes, so we can see how you so are did, against the. I think both of us went for vanilla. Yeah. Um, again, it's it's a sweet one. Um, I would say almonds again. Now that you said marzipan on the nose. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go cherry. I don't know why I'm gonna throw throw a weird fruit out there. Right, give me a second, just to. Um. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not getting anything else. Okay. Honest. Fresh, mellow notes of pear. Ooh, okay. I, I can't taste that, mm, but yeah, I mean pear is quite mellow anyway. Yeah. So what's now- mellow pear? Have you ever, I've never had pear juice. Have, have you? Yeah. No, it'd be like in, your, in an actual fruit juice, just a pear, yeah? Yeah, you've, yeah. You've had pear juice? Yeah. I don't, I, I don't think I have. Yeah. I well... Mean, the closest is, you know, when you get those tin pears and you kind of jug oh, the... Oh, yeah, I love that. That's Them us. and the tin peaches. Oh, classic. Oh. Okay, the next, next, next description, I don't understand this one. Creamy peaches. I mean, I'm, we're getting close to the canned... Canned fruit, wasn't it, that we had <laughs> last need, time? Yeah, I need stone fruits. fruits. Yeah, <laughs> I can. Now, I can understand I the can peaches. Kind of pick up. I kind of. There's the something. Cream, yeah, though, yeah. No, because cream's got that particular type of sweetness, doesn't it? Do you know what okay, I mean? Okay, more. Yeah, it's more milky. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Very hard to describe. This does. There is a fruity thing about this. Uh, well, whiskey. you could say fruit. Okay, here's the other fruit. Uh, pineapple. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm just getting a lot of sweetness and a lot of fruits, but I mean, this is the fruits has really come to the fore once I've heard all of your fruits. I don't think it's overly sweet though. You know how yeah. with some of them they're almost a bit sickly. No, yeah. this is it's, it's nice. It's, it's like a well balanced sweetness. Yeah. yeah. Today we're not drinking this with any ice, and actually, as a whiskey to do without ice, it's pretty yeah. good. Yeah, actually, yeah. I'd, if this was Smokehead without ice, there'd be a different verdict going on. Is there actually a logic or a rule behind when you're meant to drink whiskey with ice and not with ice, or is it just personal preference? I think it is just personal preference. Is it? Yeah, it's not like because I know with certain wines, there's certain glasses you're meant to drink it out of, aren't you? Because well, of the yeah. aeration. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I the less said saying. about that, the better. Yeah, <laughs> don't, don't worry, I'm not going to yeah. talk about that. <laughs> And uh, for the other bit of the palette, and a hint of Demera sugar. I've never heard of Demera sugar. It's like sugar. a brown sugar. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. That makes sense. They probably used it in the manufacture. Okay, on to the finish. I won't let you taste again. I'll go straight into it. Rich, smooth, and refreshing. A signature Speyside malt. Oh. I'd say, actually, as whiskey goes, it is very refreshing. Yeah. I, I was about to say, I, I think... Whiskey companies should be banned from using the word refreshing. Refreshing to me is you've been on a run and you're, just, you're, you're gasping for some ice cold water. Not. I suppose it's a spectrum a thing, isn't it? You know, yeah. you, you, in, in the whiskey spectrum, is this the one that if you had the choice, you've you've got you know ten glasses, you've got the smokehead on one side, and you've just finished your run, <laughs> and you've got to choose between the smokehead or this. I, I kind of get that refreshment. No, I, I like the thought going through your head, Luke, that you've just finished your run and you go straight to the whiskey section or alcohol section yeah. looking yeah. for that perfectly refreshing beverage. It, it could be their advert, you know, me running along the road, <laughs> making Sweaty, great time, yeah. getting it, I mean, maybe not yeah. me, maybe a professional athlete, an Olympian, <laughs> getting into the kitchen, sweat, mopping off the brow. You know, that, that would work well if it was an advert and then the next break, it shows you absolutely levered. <laughs> It goes. It's Nick. a spot. <laughs> well, no, it would just be me taking it out of the fridge, taking a glug, and then turning to the camera, giving the thumbs up. <sighs> could work. Could work. Uh, yeah, I'm quite impressed with this whiskey. It's it's going down very easily. I also had a, look, a quick look where Speyside is, um, and it's right on the the north uh, coast of um, yeah, it's far of north of Edinburgh. And yeah, it's it's a river. I think the river is Spey. Okay. That, that's where they, they get the water from. Quite near Aberdeen, isn't it? I think it's fur, further north. So it, it's on the mainland, it's not an island? No, it's uh, on, on mainland Scotland, okay. yeah. Because okay. we had another okay. Speyside one, I can't remember. I think it was the, the... Cardew Reserve, possibly. I oh, think you're right, yeah. What I quite like about this is they've uh, they've stamped the uh, batch number on it. So obviously they make them in large batches. And so this is batch 308. 
And this is this has apparently been going since 1966. So they can't be making that much. I would be incredibly impressed if someone could tell the difference between batch 308 and 309. (laughs) Supposedly there is a big... uh, I mean, I was listening to the Joe Rogan podcast where they were talking about how uh, each barrel has its own unique taste. I don't know if they use... They might use just a big distillery. I Mm. I don't know if they use, but they were saying that like each tree, depending on the age of the tree that you use, will have a distinctive flavour. And yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of... Interesting. I, I don't think I would be able to tell the difference. I but... always find it remarkable with commercial alcohols how the taste is consistent from drink to drink to drink. Like, if you're making alcohol yourself, there's always going to be big changes between one batch to the next. That, that was a, they used to have uh, elephant lager or Chang, it was a Chang lager in Thailand like 10 years ago, and they used to put the percentage between 4 and 8%. Yeah. Because they never knew. <laughs> Huge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Variety. It's quite honest, though. I'm glad they did that. Yeah. Uh, honest, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would you have to put on the mead you make, Leia? <laughs> well, <laughs> funnily enough. Well, it'd be drinkable, non drinkable. <laughs> <laughs> drinkable, <laughs> life or death. Yeah. <laughs> Anywho, we should really get onto the book, shouldn't we? We should. Uh, so I'm going to pass you on to Luke, who is going to do our quick synopsis. Yes, a very quick synopsis, or try to. So, what I would say this book is about is it's Voltaire making a political and philosophical statement in his standard satirical style through the vehicle of a character called Condide who begins or at least is is living in the beginning of the book a quite pampered lifestyle as the adopted son of a Bavarian baron um, and it consequently follows his story from being um, outcast from his homeland and traversing massive parts of the world in search of his love, whose name I really struggle to <laughs> pronounce. We, uh, l- let's all give it a go. How do, how do we think we pronounce her name? You know, I've even forgotten the spelling. C- Kun- <laughs> Kuningard, C- yeah. Kun- it's Kun- one of those, because, you know, when you, you read a book, sometimes I just blank out names I can't really under- uh, understand. Yeah. And I just like, oh, yeah. yeah. You know, move on. I'm not going to really be. You recognise the name, so you don't think of spelling it out. It's in like your head. Kunigard. It's like a German. Kunigonde. Yeah. Kunigonde. <laughs> Kunigonde. Let's try and make it sound in, more feminine. In my head, every time I saw it, I just thought curmudgeon, and that was <laughs> it. <laughs> but yeah, it's a. It's essentially a, a philosophical and political piece using the adventures or misadventures rather of a. Of a, an eternally or almost eternally optimistic character called Condide searching for love. I think that is. It, it's quite a hard summary to do because. So much happens. Yeah, it, it, what, what I think the, the best kind of modern fiction I could parallel this with is like a comic book. In the fact that it feels like you're, you're traversing so many different scenes you know, within two pages. Mm. And, you know, he kind of flips, like within maybe 50 pages, you're flipping from Germany to Bulgaria to. Um, El Dorado on to um, also first we go to Britain we've gone through France there's Portugal uh, ends in Constantinople yeah. Venice um, you know you're, you're constantly I mean also we should say that it really is to call it a book is probably is a nice thing it really is quite a short book in the fact that it's about 80 pages 15,000 words uh, mm. but you know so much happens uh, in the in respect to the yeah. character uh, that yeah, it, it feels a lot longer. The modern book or modern series it reminded me of is the series of unfortunate events. The way it just continuously bad luck happens again and again, and then it looks brighter, then bad luck hits again. Yeah, you can tell it's a book where he's just trying to make a point, and it's almost <laughs> the most efficient way he can make that point as possible, and the most humorous way is what he's aiming for. So he doesn't flesh it out like other authors would a novel in terms of oh I need to pace it in this particular way or you know develop these characters in a particular way it's just him making this quite quite funny statement throughout in a very very fast paced way I I think that that's kind of an interesting idea because you know none of the characters really have depth they more represent kind of philosophical ideas you know and we if we go through a few of the characters for example Pangloss, who is his instructor, represents this idea of uh, all is good in all the best of worlds. Mm. Uh, then you've got Candide, who's this idea of optimism. Uh, yeah. 
and then you've got uh, Kunigard, who's this idea of just you know beauty. Uh, and it seems like the characters aren't really characters; they're more just uh, personifications of ideas or you know human qualities. Yeah, they're the they caricatures, aren't they? Exactly, they're yeah. caricatures. You know, you get it. Like with Condi, it is the a caricature of the optimist, just taken to the extreme. And you know, later in the book, he meets the very wealthy lord of uh, in Venice. It's just a caricature of, you know, the overindulged. She finds no pleasure in life anymore. And then he is with a philosopher for quite a while called Martin, who is a caricature of an utter pessimist in every way and just thinks humans are a parasite, basically. So it's just every character is a a complete caricature of of what they're meant to be or represent, I think. Yeah, this book is a stark contrast from uh, the, the, the lady in the fur coat. Madonna and a Madonna, Madonna, Madonna and a Furco. I thought you were going to say Fur Master. Say... <laughs> yeah, no, a contrast in the fact you get such a breadth of characters in this because it's just so high paced. It's by far the highest paced book that we reviewed. Mm. So, so let's maybe go back to an initial question. What, what were your general thoughts? I actually really enjoyed it. I, I quite, in, I, I, in, I do enjoy fast paced books anyway. I, I, I like the the feeling they give you almost that breakneck speed. Um, but beyond that, I think a lot of the interactions and scenarios he created were very clever, obviously very funny as well. Um, so from start to finish, I, I enjoyed it. Um, yeah. Dare I say, for me, it was a little bit too high-paced. Um, I would have liked to see him going a bit further into the characters and develop them a bit more and have less characters, actually. And that's a lot for me to say, because normally when I look at books, it's the opposite way around. I it, I think, though, this is the only book that I've read from that era. And so for me, it was really big, a really good insight into the world and basically everyday lives in Europe at the time. Yeah, I think taking on your point, I think the one thing I really liked about it was the social commentary of the time. You know, how it depicted religion, how it depicted love, how it depicted a world that really was struggling with so many different blights. You know, you had war, you had disease, you had, uh, you know, immorality with rich and poor. And it was, mm. for me, a really interesting social commentary on, on that particular epoch that Voltaire was living in. However, it, 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 I didn't enjoy the book because I just didn't find it that nuanced, interesting piece of literature. As I said, referred back to I, I thought it was more like a comic book in that it, it was there to please rather there, than there to make you think and for me I, I prefer books that move into the latter but you know that's it, it still is an interesting book yeah see I, I disagree in that for me it was a book that evoked a lot of thought rather than was just there to uh, naturally a part of it is there to entertain because that was Voltaire's style to be satirical and basically take the piss as much as possible but I think he, you know, there are a lot of points in there he made, or a lot of a lot of ideas and situations he created, which led on to trails of thought beyond the book, and led me to thinking more in depth about you know, certain certain elements, particularly of I don't know what that period was. Was that still medieval period, late late modern age, early it's modern? It's kind age? of renaissance, isn't it? Renaissance, renaissance, like, yeah. yeah. Um, so I I, th- I think it was quite thought provoking, but. I, it's it's difficult because you do feel like there's certain parts of it which it would be beneficial for him to settle on more and, and explore in further detail and maybe he could make a grander, more poignant point by doing that. But simultaneously, I think you've got to appreciate it for what it is, which is almost you know a political pamphlet or a philosophical pamphlet rather than a novel. It's It, it feels like he's sat down just to write, write one big joke, essentially, against people he disagrees with rather than sit down and think i'm going to write a, a piece of literature it's so yeah, he, I, think, I think you've got to almost appreciate it for that did, did you ever find it laugh out loud at any points i never did and i know it's supposed to be satirical the whole time but for me it was never that comical in terms of satirical i think the only credit we have to give voltaire is if we even go back to our own uh podcast with dante and you see how really voltaire is is you know pointing the finger at so many characters who for us they're not really characters of relevance 
because we mm. don't know the the kings, we don't know the the bishops, we don't know all of the. Yeah, so it, probably, it might have been laugh out loud at the time. Is that you know? It's like you're doing a contemporary piece about Trump or something. Like, you know, it's only funny now. It's not going to be funny in two hundred years' time, is it? Yeah. Because no one's really going to know the specifics. So I, I think it, it is hard to kind of contextualize humor. Uh, when you're trying to do it 200 years down the line. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's very fair. Uh, I I didn't find it laugh out loud funny, but I did find it humorous quite often. It's probably a more appropriate word. There was a lot of commentary. I, I think the ones that always kind of picked my mind were uh, his commentary on religion and how, uh, you know, the interplay of them wanting money, you know, in order to allow you an entry to God and, you know, an exit, to, uh, an entry to heaven. Uh, so, yeah, uh, moving on to another question. I think this is really just trying to underpin because, as we, we've spoken about, it's, it was a, h- a fast-paced novel that covered a lot of ground. Uh, and so the question is just, you know, what do you think is the central message uh, Voltaire wanted to convey in Candide? Well, that's a good one. Um, I would say the central meaning of this book is be content with what you have and make life good where you are. Don't try and go out exploring you're going to put yourself in danger. And it's it's not a very good message, to be quite honest. So this, uh, I can only, uh, I think what you're pointing to is the, the end scene, which we'll move on to later. Yeah. But it, for me, the whole course of the book doesn't really get to, the, that end scene just seems to be 10 pages at the end where he kind of puts a, a deeper philosophical meaning to the meaning of life. Yeah. But for me, I think the, the underpinning of this was a real tack. Uh, uh, the name is, again, uh, going to be a struggle, but I think it's called Leibniz. Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, who developed this uh, almost religious theology that uh, God created the perfect universe. And, OK, yes, he may require this person to die or suffer an, an insufferable event, but ultimately, that is for the best purpose and the best world that we could possibly create. Yeah, I've heard that Voltaire, as an author, he very much thought that God had created the universe and then took a step back. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, so I guess to give a bit of background on Leibniz, I, I don't know a lot about it, but he was a mathematician, a scientist. He actually made some pretty important contributions to those fields. But his idea of on theology and the the reason why... God is apparently omnipotent and omnibenevolent, yet there's so much suffering in the world. He developed the theory which became known as Leibniz optimism, um, that this is the best of all possible worlds because God could have created any other world and he would only create the best possible world. So even though there's some terrible parts of it, it's necess- that is the best possible world oh, that so could have been necessary. created. Okay. Um, and yeah, Voltaire just... I think to his core was completely against this <laughs> and no, that no, it was no. the most absurd <laughs> way of thinking don't you think sometimes the bo- book proved uh, this Leibniz guy right for example there's one point where he gets shortchanged by a guy trying to take him across the Atlantic and he takes all his money on the boat and leaves him behind and then later on you see that uh, boat, same boat being attacked by the French Navy yeah but it still doesn't change the course of the story for Condide really and I think that's his point in a way that he's trying to show how foolhardy it is that these people believe in this optimistic view of God and the world he's created and that this is the best of all possible worlds because they almost get a morsel of good luck here and there or a bit of justice or a bit of redemption. But actually, in the grand scheme of it, it's still all going very wrong for them. And there's there's no justification. That's. I mean, the, the greatest credit, I suppose, Voltaire can be given is the fact that no one knows who Leibniz is now. You know, you don't do any modern philosophy and you hear Leibniz's name as being a contemporary philosopher who really challenged or was insightful in how the world would develop in the modern age. Mm. But a hundred years later, you had people throwing, you know, saying religion wasn't relevant anymore. So you didn't have much of a chance. Yeah. Sure, but the, the reason he didn't have much chance is because his philosophy was based on not not real factors. You know, it was based on this conception that there is a God and so there must be the perfect universe that he's looking on and deciding these decisions. I, I, I think Elliot's right. I think first and foremost it's it's his just personal attack against <laughs> Leibniz's Oh, there's a few ideas. personal attacks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, he doesn't... I, I think it, he uses it more broadly as well to pick on all these serious ideas or seemingly serious ideas which dictated people's lives at, at the time when he was alive and, you know, living... Um, and and just tries to show 
how trivial they are and meaningless they are and you know people let themselves be dictated back then in the, in the you know the renaissance in the 18th century or whenever it was the, the, 18th century yeah 18th yeah, century that you know they get dictated to by their status by the religious order by the political order by you know the up and coming philosophical ideas and actually it's very meaningless because Condide experiences all of it and just goes from misfortune to misfortune or misadventure to misadventure or highs to lows and it just has very little implication on his life ultimately so I think he's just trying to paint it all as being very trivial it's... there's a great example uh, which I have stolen from Dan Carlin's uh, Wrath of the Khans but of this idea of Leibniz philosophy and so the uh, one of the Pope's messengers uh, took a message to uh, one of the Khans when they retreated once they got to Hungary um, and they retreated back. N- not this is Genghis Khan this and is, his horse. Yeah, uh, and he took a message and gave it to Genghis Khan. The message read, like, you know, you must bow down to the one Lord, you know, he is almighty, and gave all this the- theological you know, rubbish. And then the, the Khans just wrote back, being like, uh, well, look, if your God is almighty, how come we're winning so much? <laughs> and, it, yeah. and it is you know it's like a complete underpinning of this even though Genghis was not known for being a morally nice person but he did allow religious freedom interestingly enough oh, really? he allowed complete religious freedom in all all the different areas which the hordes that were broken up into <laughs> control um, it's it just if you were at the front you were screwed Yeah, well, that's yeah, the impression yeah, I get but once, once they conquered they allowed complete autonomy in terms of what religion you followed how yeah. you wanted to live they, it was very like soft touch for them. Just so brutal at the front. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Bit off topic. <laughs> <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Uh, next question. Uh, you know, what what characters did you find engaging and why? For me, it's going to have to be Martin, the pessimistic philosopher at the end. I think he comes up with a few brilliant quotes. Um, I think. Pangloss, uh, who's the original philosopher that seems to be aiding Candid the whole time. And Candid uh, is always seems to be a bit lost without his philosopher. He, it's as if a philosopher back then was your psychologist. Mm. He always wants to talk to his uh, philosopher. And then Martin, he latches on to this philosopher later on and goes, oh, basically I need a psychologist to talk to me the whole time or whatever. He just wants to have a soulmate who he thinks is more articulate. Anywho, Martin's pessimistic the whole time. And he makes a few jabs at society, which I think pretty good. Who, who do you think Voltaire saw himself as out of the characters? Candide. I don't think so. No. Candide's so naive. He wouldn't. He wouldn't see himself as Candide. No. Maybe as a young boy or something like that. But I think as a maybe maybe, maybe that's the, the passage he's writing about Candide as a young man, and then maybe he meets well, Martin. From the way you've just described Leibniz, he's making Pangloss Leibniz, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, no, th- yeah, definitely. That's that's the idea. But that's why Voltaire can't be Condide, because Condide <laughs> is so <laughs> dedicated to, yeah. To, yeah, yeah. to Pangloss throughout the entire book. And he's, uh, the thing is, uh, Voltaire's not you know, despondent enough to be Martin either. I mean, I don't know an awful lot about Voltaire, but... He sounds uh, like he had fun. Yeah, the, the impression I get from Condide is he just sees it as one big joke, almost. He just, it, even in things that people would think uh, in a pessimistic way or disastrous he would I feel like he would look at it with (laughs) humour yeah but I I, I'm the same as Matty though I uh, Martin for me was the he's the character I've I've found the most interesting and I enjoyed it from the start so to give a bit of explanation Condide first comes across Martin because he has lost most of his fortune after acquiring all this gold in El Dorado. He has been robbed. Um, he's looking to make his way to Europe, I think, to Bordeaux. Yeah. And he decides he needs a shipmate because he's lost his previous servant, Cacambo. He doesn't have any friends with him. Um, and he goes out and is determined to find the most despondent most dissatisfied and most unfortunate creature he can so he to can take on it. his journey with him <laughs> because that that's the only way he thinks they'll have any kind of rapport and martin isn't even that unfortunate 
it's just a yeah <laughs> it's persona he it's reminds persona, me of they... uh do you remember marvin from uh, hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy yeah <laughs> <laughs> just like the worst travel companion you know you're, you're out in the middle of the atlantic it's like beautiful blue seas There's, Oh, this Atlantic's you know going to kill us. I, I honestly think a really depressed person would keep your sanity more than a really happy person. The thing is, I'm, I, I, I know, obviously, in the, in the whole scheme of the book, Martin appears for quite a lot of time towards the end, but it was still a very small amount of time because the book's so, so short. Um, but I always found myself questioning, is he a pessimist or is he a realist? Mm. Because there's parts where they sail by England and they somehow come close enough to the cliff that they see an admiral be executed. <laughs> and Martin says, oh, the English execute an admiral every so often for losing too many men because it inspires the other ones. And Condi Do, thinks this is an inter- outrage. Interestingly, Voltaire actually sent an affidavit to the English written by uh, of the French general who, uh, who was the in opposite to the admiral who got executed, saying that the admiral did actually put a valiant effort in. Yeah, so really? actually, yeah, Voltaire did did uh, you know try and save this admiral's life, uh, but yeah, to, to no avail. The English still executed him. Oh, so that was based on a real, yeah, yeah, yeah. A true, is, true this story. This is a true story. Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. I knew he woven in some true, true events, but I didn't know that was. That yeah, was so the, the general he knew when he moved to England for three years. Yeah. Uh, and they'd obviously like you know, I don't know how the circles worked at that time, but you know, networked or whatever, and then. Yeah, he'd got in touch with the the opposite French general, French uh, admiral, and yeah, sent over that ad- affidavit. Which this book gave an insight into all the different uh, you know European countries and a little bit about how their cultures worked. And of course, the only insight we get into Britain is the executing of this mm. admiral. But I didn't think it was that negative, you know, just executing yeah. admirable. It's strange because since Voltaire spent so much time there, when he was banished as well from France. Or it, it, yeah, he, it was like a voluntary he, exile. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because they I were think... going to imprison him, and he. I, I, I did read about this, and I loved the story that they were going to imprison him, and he suggested as an alternative that they he just goes to England, and they were like, yeah, that's that's as bad. As <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's equally as bad, sure. <laughs> to England, oh, oh terrible. <laughs> But it just shows that the wealth and gentry back then, they could get what they wanted. Oh, yeah. If that was a commoner going, ah, play some kind of boat. Voltaire but... wasn't from enormous wealth. Uh, yeah, he, he was. was some, no, he, it no, was like not a enormous. minor government official. Was his... his dad was a prominent lawyer. Yeah. yeah. But so not, but not, not we're not talking aristocracy. Yeah, we're not talking yeah, aristocracy. Not, no. no nobility at all. And I think that's his big gripe, um, you know, the end of the novel where... Uh, Kunigard's uh, brother says, "You know, you can't marry. You know, Candide can't marry you because you're of non-noble blood." Yeah. And he then, you know, ties him up and puts him back on the slaver ship. And I think, you know, that that's a, a big idea for Voltaire. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I, I think maybe this is a good point to jump into. You know, why did the book cause so much controversy at the time of publication? I think because, I mean, it, it attacks so many ideals predominantly religious ideals um, and in in the space of very few pages manages to insult most <laughs> European countries yeah. as well <laughs> and, and the entire function of the aristocracy the nobility, royalty um, the social hierarchy um, it's, it's uh, incredibly dangerous, even now I feel that this would be an incredibly dangerous book Oh yeah. no! Now it would be the racism in it that's going on that would be uh, dangerous. Well, not not racism so much, but well, yeah, maybe so. It would still be a dangerous book to publicise nowadays as a new author. No, I'm saying obviously if he contemporised it, not not just word for word. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I mean, there's so many attacks on you know every single institution, isn't there? It's pretty bloody about how he kind of incriminates the clergy, how he incriminates the hierarchy and the nobility. Um, you know how he basically all the kind of underpinnings of, and the fabric of society he points a finger and says this is all bullshit and I I being having networked and having been around these people know that it's bullshit yeah and you'd think when you when you try and look down at somebody or make fun of them that you just choose a certain set to make fun of so you're safe to go somewhere else but when you're doing country to country to country you are it, you know it is quite dangerous but it's also more dangerous because he would have literally you know been drinking wine and eating with these you know he spent years with frederick the great 
you know, he was courted all around Europe by all the n- nobility. I, I get an impression of Europe at this time that if you're wealthy, you can travel around very easy. There's no passports. So if you're in trouble somewhere, you can just go to another European country if you've got the purse behind you. Yeah, no, as opposed uh, to the pre-Renaissance passport era. <laughs> <laughs> the post-Renaissance passport era. <laughs> I just think the movement between countries, if you're wealthy, was very, very easy back then. Very, very easy. Oh, yeah, So if you definitely. got in trouble somewhere, you could eat easily go somewhere else and they weren't going to extradite you back to that but country. Also, this guy's no. also a very well-known... You know, his own right, he's a very well-known writer. Uh, you know, he's done plays that have been big hits. You know, he's he's a big name. He's probably, I think, Frederick the Great called him, you know, the leading uh, figure, lead, leading intellectual in our current epoch. Mm. So, you know, we, of course, this dude is going to get touted wherever by any nobility because, you know, he's one of the few rare greats in an era. And you've got to think, there were a lot of... It was almost the Renaissance was the beginning of wealthy and powerful people becoming self-deprecating and self-hating as well there wasn't this veil of complete superiority Mm. they they actually you know and and quite a few writings around that time saw the flaws in their own character and the flaws in their own position obviously you see it now wealthy people talk about (laughs) talk about about you know the corporate social responsibility or you know the environment or Uh, we need to pay our tax yeah i see more like the angry teenager (laughs) taking on their parents and going against what they stand for Mm. this idea that the wealthy are now actually having a go at themselves it's that wasn't really allowed to happen before and it more and more it's being allowed to happen but the, the fact that Voltaire was loved showed that they did like having, you know, because th- they knew that a lot of the people around them were probably not very good people. Because I mean, they you know, like any circle of friends or family, or you know that they're not all, all superior human beings. This is one of my problems with the book. Actually, the characters he creates in it, it's pretty black and white. They're either very good characters or they're very bad characters. He doesn't have much of a middle ground. Real life is yeah. mostly great. People in the middle. Yeah, there is a lack of nuance. That but is he's a fair not point. Trying to reflect real life, I think, is the. If is he was the trying point. to reflect he's... real life, this book would be a lot longer. Yeah, he's he's trying to make a mirror image of very big ideals in the, in the world. Yeah, yeah. In, in a yeah very expedited manner. But I, I think what made it probably most dangerous was it's, it's a relentless attack on religion. I mean, you've got you know the inquisitor who's keeping. A girl. The girl yeah. is, you know, a, a shared sex object. <laughs> You've got the old lady who's a pope's daughter who, the, you know, was allowed to go through disgrace and be yeah. traded off, even though it was the pope's daughter. I mean, that just undermines the apparent power of the church that that can happen. I mean, it is... It's, got the Jesuits. The Jesuits, you know, Kill yeah. the Jesuit, kill the Jesuit. Yeah. In You've nurse. got as well, you know, I imagine at the time the Jesuit uprising was maybe quite a sensitive topics that yes. that, the, that you could create these power states in colonies that could challenge a European power and yet he portrays how a Bavarian prince or lord who was presumed dead goes over and then just joins the Jesuits <laughs> that it's not this binary you know dividing line between good and bad that there's just a p- political affiliations that can be very malleable it's around optimism. religion yeah which to, I imagine at the time was considered sacrilege because no, you're either pious and right or you're a sinner and wrong. So I think, th- I mean, yeah, he, he it is, it's a struggle to go ten pages without him ripping into the church in some way or form. So I think that's probably the most dangerous part of it. I reckon to British readers at the time it wouldn't have been so shocking because the church in England didn't have as much power as, let's say, the Catholic Church did in France. Well, they would separated sure as well. Yeah. So. If, for them, it probably wasn't, which is maybe why he didn't spend that much time talking about England. Well, I think he also, he, from my understanding, he quite he quite had a lot of respect for the English because they were much more liberal in you know freedom of speech, freedom of religion than you know what he'd experienced in France and other parts of Europe. Yeah. So I think maybe if you are doing a satirical novel, it's quite hard to satire some some aspects that you have a bit more respect for. What do you think is his worst attack in the book? For me, it's the war with Britain and France. And he oh, talks, the Seven Year War. It is the Seven Year oh, War yeah. where he talks about the war over a few acres in Canada and whoever will win will have the biggest madhouse who has the most mad people to send into the war. Um, 
I thought that was a, I thought it was really clever and for him to say that. But of course, with a war that had been going on for that long, killing that many people, uh, that is very sensitive to say. Like, mm. you know, we cut even like with coronavirus going around at the moment. Uh, we, you know, you can't really joke about it. But that war would have killed, you know, in proportion of the population, very similar amounts. It's quite and to cost very similar amounts of money to coronavirus. It would have been seriously cutting to make jokes about it. I yeah. The only other one I can think of, and I, I don't think it's as cutting as what you're saying about, is when he's. Where is he again? Oh, it's so difficult to keep track of his location. It's when I think is he in Venice for the. It's when he's somewhere for the carnival. Do you remember he's with the yeah, carnival? Yeah, Venice. Is it Venice? Yeah. And he's at the in the inn, and he finds himself at a table with lots of deposed <laughs> royal family members, you know, princes and kings and sultans. And I know at that time, you know, the, the question of absolutism had been challenged quite heavily, but to present it as a whole series of royal household members and deposed princes and just to show how fickle and pointless their position is and that they've all just come here for a good time because they have nothing else to do because their country has forsaken them I think that would have been not not to the same degree as what you were talking about but I think that would have been quite controversial at least at yeah. the time just to dilute the significance of a royal family to say oh I'm, I've walked into an inn and I'm sat with <laughs> these seven deposed kings you know they come and go they're, they're worthless <laughs> yeah I think definitely an attack on nobility would have been because I mean, he is just pointing to them mm. and saying, "You, you, you yeah. are not good for the common person." You know, that's a, a, a big line of his. Well, you're morally corrupt. Morally, yeah. and also the, the, there's lines about him. You know, the, the nobility exploiting the weak for their own benefit and the poor. And you know, there, there does definitely seem yeah. this kind of almost, uh, I hate to say, it, Marxist angle to it that there's an exploitation of, uh, you know, the the rich and the poor and the against you know. The capital. Yeah, we saw a little twist of Marxism kick in with El Dorado, didn't we? Well, yeah, that's a, let's touch on that now. You know, what is the significance of El Dorado? El Dorado, to me in the book, is flawed utopia. Yeah. So just to give a, a bit of a Perfect. backdrop uh, of El Dorado. So Candide, about midway through the book, mm. uh, after being chased by the Jesuits f- from killing a man, after almost being eaten by cannibals... Uh, Eventually stumbles on uh, the most you know hidden gem in in all of South America, uh, El Dorado, and you know he's presented with a world that is very different from that that he's found so far in his travels in Europe. Yeah, absolutely. It it seems completely idyllic. Everyone's at peace. They you know they live in gold gilded houses. He talks about going to what seemed to him relatively speaking in an impoverished house and it was because their door was made of silver instead of gold um and and you know it seems as if everything is perfect but where i find the flawed utopia message is that condi tries to challenge the leader of el dorado about oh well what do you do when people disagree with you or what do you do when this happens and the leader of El Dorado says, "Oh, that doesn't happen. We never, you know, we never debate what leaders decide. We never debate religion. We never. It, it just basically seemed to be that there was no. It was a place where everything was tranquil and perfect, but there was no free thought. Almost. I suppose that you, is a utopia, isn't it? You know, it's almost like thought it, it, with it, with having free thought and discussion. You're always chasing something unattainable, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't you yeah, be a little true. bit scared if you went to any countries and they said, "Oh, there are no prisons in this country"? Uh no, because I'm, I'm sure. I mean, does the Sark have a prison <laughs> for one person? Sark does have a, oh, really? a prison. Yeah, it has a jail. Well, yeah. a jail is probably more. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't because I'm sure if you went to parts of Antarctica, there wouldn't be a prison. But I, I, I wouldn't be particularly scared. You're not going to get mugged at night in Antarctica. Probably not, yeah. (laughs) From Voltaire's perspective, maybe why he... What he was doing in quite a nuanced way in in portraying it as flawed was when he... Condide was challenging them about religion and the leader said, well, just what the... You know, we, we have no priests. Just we know what we believe and what we believe is true and therefore nobody needs to speak about it or challenge it. 
Oh, I didn't see that. For me, that I didn't see that as flawed at all. Um, but I think for Voltaire, that would have been flawed because that's exactly what he's trying to do. I, so it's almost this world where he wouldn't. Yeah, exist. he wouldn't be relevant. Yeah. <laughs> I have a firm belief. If there was, let's say, let's say Jersey uh, was separated from the rest of the world. And it continued for that for hundreds and hundreds of years. Do you think there would be separate religions on Jersey? I don't think there were ever, religions would ever separate. I think it would only ever stay one religion. I think religion. I mean, I think this is a very different question. Yeah. Because I mean, it's it's impossible to say how societies would change because, again, ev- everything everything is in such a state of flux. I mean, look at if you go to say a place uh, like Belgium, it has three different languages in a country that's about a hundred miles long. Yeah. And, you know, with with that has, diff- you know, they don't even have, they have three different states. And, you know, things can happen so quickly that you don't really understand the logic for. Uh, it, you're right. In a way, it's not worth, you know, hypothesizing about. Yeah. But, I mean, what I found interesting was uh, the use of El Dorado. Because, you know, we, we know that this, there's, like, this mythical quality. The of, land of the gold. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, yeah, I wonder if in his time... And a really was... bad Shakira album. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I wonder if in his time there was an actual genuine belief that El Dorado was a reality. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't know that, but it does seem, the way he talks about it, it doesn't seem oh, that it's... I, I'm sure people thought it might be reality. Like, nowadays, we think it is mythical. But I'm sure, back then, it was bordering between legend and real. Yeah, because... All well, the, pl- the, the century before, Walter Riley had Quote, done yeah. an expedition. Well, he'd done an entire ex- uh, for quite a few people had done expeditions to El Dorado to try and discover the golden oh, really? city. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, and and Walter Rowley wrote an account of it that was egregiously inflated because he came back to England and presented all the nobility who'd funded his journey with these rocks with little tiny bits of gold in, and they all thought they'd been. They got on a terrible deal, so he wrote this massively inflated account. Genius. Um, to basically justify it, but yeah, it was, it was it, in people's minds. It was definitely a, a genuine place somewhere that could be found, um, and pro- undoubtedly still in Voltaire's time. That it was something that was out there that was just hidden. And you've got to think there were definitely still parts of the world that were hidden during oh, Voltaire's yeah. time. Oh yeah, that that was, uh, Amazonian yeah. tribes Massive. were untouched until the eighties. Still. It's interesting. There's a recount of somebody uh, going uh, through the Amazon. Uh, I, I don't know, you know, around probably Voltaire's time, and he said that the Amazon was filled with village to village to village. You know, it was absolutely packed with people along the riverside. Yeah, and then you know, a uh, hundred years later or whatever, they did the same journey and nobody was there, and they all called him a liar. But now people are starting to unf- you know find in the Amazon because of all the deforestation that there's a lot of uh, unrevealed landscapes. Uh, mm. And they just think that the you know the smallpox and all the European diseases uh, combined oh. with you know probably just the Europeans taking a lot of a lot of infrastructure away yeah just decimated these cities within ten oh. to twenty oh, years. Yeah. Small smallpox was enormously devastating. So smallpox got introduced to Central America in fifteen twenty, so by the Spanish, and they mm-hmm. think it was a slave that the Spanish were bringing over who had it, and within six months. The population of Central America went from 22 million to 16 million. By 1580, it had gone down to 2 million. So you li- it literally almost destroyed the entire and also, population. Also, can you imagine if a disease was uh, spreading around? You'd abandon cities instantly, wouldn't you? Mm. You're not going to go back to a city if you know that the smallpox is around, you want to protect your kids. Yeah. So the first thing you do is, I'm getting my family and we're, we're getting the hell as far away from any civilization and as possible. And then starvation mm. kick in at that point when you're on the road. Yeah. But, but I, I, think his, I think his point is, because at the time El Dorado probably was still something that was in, in the realms of reality that was seen as the, the golden city, the I- idyllic image of perfection... And I think the point he's trying to make is that's not something we should strive for. That's flawed. Oh, this, no, I'm, I'm no, 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 no. I'm very opposite. I think he he keeps talking about it. He gets to somewhere like in Paris and he goes, oh, it'd be better in El Dorado. And he keeps saying that until the very end. Mm. Well, he, he feels utopia would be boring. Well, the world he's in is filled with earthquakes, violence, sex, you know, uh, scandal. Yeah, that's the world Voltaire inhabits and loves and thrives in. So yeah, this idea of having a, an actual nice, normal, quiet, cozy country life, 
nah, not not for Voltaire. And I think he exemplifies it in the fact he leaves El Dorado with all these sheep of gold, <laughs> and by the time he gets anywhere where he can make it count, he's lost it all. It's you know it's worthless. Yeah, he is he is taken you know enough gold to make him the richest man in the world and by bad chance it's disappeared and i think i think that's his way of indicating that you know el dorado is a poison chalice yeah to me at least so what what quote were you gonna hit upon matthias oh the quote uh, it's a quote from martin uh which is talking about this reality is sometimes far more exciting with all its negatives rather than a perfect society. Do you have the quote? Yeah, it's, it's right here. Martin says, Man was born to live either in a state of distracting inequitude <laughs> or a lethargic disgust. That's it. I thought that summed it up. That uh, humans, you can give them everything they want, but if they're living a boring life, they're not going to enjoy it. Let's say a nobility who stays in their castle the whole time. Or you can give them challenge after challenge after challenge. And if it's too difficult, they'll still be unhappy. You've got to find that happy medium where people can live comfortably enough, but still have distressing challenges. I mean, I've always found this so true. You know, if, if you go to poorer countries than, than ours, you know, it, because they have to toil to the land and they've got a very strict routine that we wake up at six o'clock in the morning, we spend X time in the fields and whatever they don't have time to worry about oh is my mental health down or you know am i as successful as all my peers you know your your pressing concern is can i feed my family will the harvest be good you know things that literally you can impact yeah the the things that our modern world very much struggles with is the fact that we we've got so much around us that we really don't have an influence on yeah uh you know how people perceive us you know, what is our next best role? What could we do better for ourselves? And yeah. those things, we have some ability to change them, but not as much as we probably give ourselves credit for. Uh, and I feel, you know, that that kind of narrative of just sometimes hard work and keeping your head down and just looking at the, the short-term goals often leads to a more rewarding life than having this, you know, not really doing much and having all the money and all the objects of material wealth. Oh, you often see it, those the, the people that have the most are the people that use the psychologists the most, you know, talk about depression and that sort of stuff. They're, in fact, the most wealthy, well-to-do people which should have the most comfortable lives. Well, it's, it, it's so relatable, isn't it? You know, exactly what Elliot said and exactly what we see in every day. People can never get enough a lot of the time. They are always thirsting for more. They want to, you know, they, they they want the bigger car, the bigger house. It's, it's, it's that kind of never-ending cycle that becomes destructive. Um, no, no, I think that's the most important features of humanity to make it go forward. It's not destructive. No, it's destructive for their own emotional well-being, but not mm. for actual society. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's you know it's it's the same way evolution. People think evolution cares about them as an individual, no. but it doesn't at all. As, as a collective species, it, it does as well. But I mean, get, well, isn't there that decimated along the way? Isn't there that spider that uh, the male spider that oh, let, it, 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 it mates it, and goes? Okay, yeah, eat me. yeah, you eat me. I mean, <laughs> does evolution be like you know? Oh yeah, all right, mate. Uh, yeah. Can you imagine being phoned up by evolution? Be like, oh yeah. So what's my role in this? Uh yeah, okay, you you've. You've got to be born. You're going to mate. Uh, oh, what? What? I'm going to be eaten? What? By my own wife? In front of my kids? Like, what? I mean, that is not a, not a beast that really... So you mean I don't have to pay them off? <laughs> 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 oh, this is just getting better. I'm <laughs> I, yeah, I can't get my head over that spider. That is a, that's a pure... It's a testament to how pretty, brutal pretty evolution mantis. is. What was the uh, What was the question we were? We, uh, we were very ponderously <laughs> pondering on Jay, yeah. Jay walking around. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I must admit, I have no idea. Uh, okay, so we'll, we'll move on to the, the next one. Yeah, so, you know, what did you make of the, the female characters in the book? I mean, they're, they're vacuous. There's yeah. no, nothing to them, really, at all. For me, they, they're they good, neutral characters. You know, they're morally good. <laughs> I'm, I'm now very confused by what you mean <laughs> by good. 
Morally <laughs> good. Morally good. Okay. So, yeah, true. There's no evil female characters like we, in the book. The main lady, which no, is... No, that is very true, actually. Uh, Connie Gondi, which yeah. we cannot pronounce. None of us can. She is a lady that's been put in many unfortunate events, but she's never immoral. She never tries to screw anyone over. She's sometimes not as strong as she could be, but she's doing what she has to to survive, and she's being goodwilled along the way. There's no, there's not any more you can ask of a human being. Morally good, but victimized. Yeah, they are. Uh, it seems Always. as if the female characters in this have a very fatalistic existence and are completely p- placid in the progression of that fate is is what it feels like. You know, curmudgeon is what I'm going to call her because I can't pronounce her name. She just seems to go from one situation to the other without any input but, in all it. All of the female characters Yeah, all of, all of them yeah, do. It's very true, very true. And, you know, the story of the old lady, she just seems to, you know get passed around and <laughs> ends up in the life she does without and any influence. And she's called Old Lady it. the whole way through. Yeah. She isn't given a name. But then, to be fair, maybe that's quite an... I mean, we're talking about the 18th century here. Maybe that's quite an accurate presentation of what would happen to... Female, yeah. A, a, you know, a, a disgrace. Well, or that's a, something I found interesting about El Dorado. They talked about going to the central court and being half women, half men. Mm. Ooh, that, that's yeah, quite, that, that is quite forward-thinking for the time. That is, actually... I think Voltaire was, he, you know, he was a modern man. I, I think he could have fit in now. Yeah, let's let's go to the the end scene of the book. Um, and yeah, so Candide. Yeah, needs needs some explanation. So Candide has returned from El Dorado. He's visited Venice uh, in suit of uh, the name who I still can't pronounce. Conigode. Conigode. Um, <laughs> uh, he's then also found out. From Kukambo, who is his loyal uh, servant, I suppose is the best way of putting it. His best it. servant, he's had by far. I, to be honest, I think Kukambo is the best servant any man could have. Oh, he, he he's is, a proper lech. He's, he he's great. He's loyal and he's clever. He's clever. He, yeah, very dedicated. No, no task seems too large for him. Yeah. Also, he's he, smart. I mean, there's so many times where uh, uh, Candide, you know, when he he slays the Jesuit, mm. and Kukambo is like, oh. Just put on his clothes and we'll pretend to be a Jesuit priest yeah. to get through. I mean, how smart is that? That's... He actually strategizes their whole time. In He's South the America. superhero. Candy yeah. is yeah. just a bloody idiot. It's like Jeeves and Wooster, yeah. isn't it, really? <laughs> Even yeah, when they Stephen have to... Fry going, yeah. I want to get out of this country. Yeah. <laughs> I'll use this Worcester. And it goes so much more wrong for him when he separates from. Oh, yeah. Because I mean, well. he... Candy is fundamentally a moron. You know, he, he's just grown up in a privileged background. Yeah, yeah. he's not world wise at all. That's that's one of his issues. He's just very fortunate in that people seem to find him really affable. And I know, suppose that's the nature of aristocracy, isn't it? Because uh, you... yeah, for me that's aristocracy. That somehow, if you're well dressed and well talked, when you go to someone, they go, "Oh, he's a nice, well dressed, well talked person. We'll invite him for dinner. We'll talk to him." It's not that. I don't think because you've got to think from the. Right from the beginning of the book, he gets disowned by Baron Thunder von Trunk. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he, he is disavowed from nobility. He falls into the Bulgarian army. So there would have been nothing about him apart from maybe his mannerisms that would have given the impression that he was nobility or from aristocracy. And none of the people who take him in are of that, that kind of caste either. There, you know, there's some educated people in there, some well-off people, but they're not from that that background. So I feel it's almost as if he he gets by on this, you know, naive good nature he has, where he's almost so innocent and pure. People uh, are drawn to him. He has this magnetism from being so the fact that he is so shielded from the world. I suppose he's a he's kind of a hidden gem in this world that he's presented with because he has innocence. Uh, but going on from just to that final scene, so uh, we've we've had Candide return from uh, uh, El Dorado. He's then gone to find Cunegarde, and it, and so he goes off to free her with the money he has left remaining. And anyway, he all of them somehow get resurrected from the dead. So you have the end scene with Pangloss, who somehow mystically. This, this, yeah, yeah this whole, he has escaped death, <laughs> and he's already an old man, and now he's rowing yeah. a boat. Like who? Who is a slave driver? Would be using an old man to row a boat. 
Uh, I mean, yeah. One one who's got not a lot of time on the well, a lot of time in the hands. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, you know, you've got this final scene um, where, where, where you have all the main characters. So you've got the old lady, Cunningard, uh Candide, uh, Cacambo. You've got the Baron's son. Is he there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Baron's off. son, yeah. Uh, and you've got all of them there. And th- this end scene kind of ends with Candide saying, you know, uh, I'm going to choose the path of no more adventures and just tilling to my land and that is you know me for the rest of my life and you know what the question i'm asking is you know what is the significance of that for me uh the significance is what i talked about earlier and what i think is the main theme of the book is be happy where you live make the best of what you've got around you don't try and go off and conquer some foreign person's land don't try and go off and make somewhere else better uh just be happy what you've got have near you but I, I understand I understand where he's coming from with that but for me it's still not a very good deep meaning I take a more pessimistic attitude with it where he's gone through the entire book obviously painting the world as this terrible turbulent callous place in many many different ways um, and on a incessant basis and it, to me, it almost seemed as if he was saying, "Just do what you need to to distract yourself from that." <laughs> yeah, you know, like the thing of you like, know, life. Keep, shit, keep but... yourself busy so you don't have to think about the fact you're going to die. Yeah, you know, it's that kind of attitude that I, I think pervades it, where he's almost saying, "You cannot escape the facts of life and the way of the world. The world is bad. Bad things happen to the majority of people. It is very cruel." All you can do is try and distract yourself from that as much as possible. You can't change it. You can't challenge it. It's just a case of making, you know, making your day feel like it's been about something very simplistic and in in its own way rewarding or content inducing rather than thinking too much about how awful everything is. The, the way I looked at it is, you know, you have this start which is underpinned by grand philosophical underpinnings of Pangloss and all these teachings about how, uh, you know, God has created this perfect universe. And the end, after all a Candide has been through, kind of summarises it that, look, stop thinking about all of this, you know, theological mumbo-jumbo and start concentrating on the reality that you can actually affect because that's ultimately going to be the life that you're going to be able to live. Because, you know, let's stop, let's move away from belief that, you know, if we have a philosophical underpinning of our own realisation of what's the perfect universe and how this all works, and let's just move into more simpler and and less refined things. And I think it's how, as well, you know, Im- impetuous people can be about their lives and what they expect from their lives. And the story of Condide is that your life for all the things you may be seeking, the woman you love, adventure, can actually be incredibly underwhelming. And that's a fact you have to accept. You know, he has to accept at the end that Kunigode is hideous, even by his own admission, that he's just trapped in philosophical discussions with Pangloss and Martin. (laughs) You know, they try and take it to somebody else. There's the famous philosopher who lives near them and they try and take the question. He shuts the door on them. shuts the door on them and basically tells them they're annoying. (laughs) (laughs) I like that. You know, it's it's obviously that he, through his adventures at different points, he, he, you know, had this very inflated image of what his life could be. And in fact, it just ended up on the banks, tending the garden, debating the same points he always has done over and over again and being married to a wife that he finds hideous but he feels obliged to to stay with or to to marry in the first place um just sorry to interrupt you but what i found interesting i think it really adds to your point was uh voltaire was you know 64 or 63 when he wrote this and so if you know that age that's a pretty old age old, anyway yeah he lived till he was 83 I know. in the 18th century that is extraordinary especially after the life that he lived that you know extraordinary but i think what it touch on your point is you know it does feel like a man who's experienced a lot of the world mm. and is writing a, a, in an older age thinking you know i've i've done 
everything I could have done. I've experienced all these new places. And what am I left with? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm left with this bitterness that uh, this is all it is. And actually, you know, there isn't as much as I once believed there was to life. I almost feel like it's a final jab at Leibniz, isn't it? To be like, oh, now at the end, I'm at the best of all possible worlds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. Or well, maybe you were right all along. <laughs> it's like he spent 99 <laughs> pages destroying him and then the final page going, but maybe you are right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> Let's take a break. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, great, definitely. And we're back for tonight's second round of tasting. We've uh, now acquainted our glasses with some uh, rather peculiar looking ice Globulets uh, in the shape of shot glasses, um, which we must. did try to put the whiskey before, in shot. <laughs> yeah, before <laughs> it melted and then sprayed everywhere. But yeah, what are your thoughts? I'm yeah, I'm still enjoying it just as much. It's it's very easy to drink. It's it's an easy drink. Yeah, I feel comparing it to the Talisker Sky, which I think did we have that last year? We had that yeah, last year. which is my favorite. That that I I felt had a bit more textual sophistication to it than this one it had more wisdom yeah wisdom oh Ooh, that's, that's that interesting is, yeah I, uh, wisdom is a hard one to quantify but there was there was something a bit more special about it this one is like very nice very easy drinking I, i've enjoyed i've enjoyed it i think we had the same with the cardu didn't we where we said the cardu was nice but i think really, this is better than the cardu i i agree but it, it falls into the same category as the Cardi, where it's nice, but almost in a way nondescript, yeah. undistinguishable. It's, it's it's not got any kind of interesting characteristic to it. But it, I'd agree with you, it's still nicer than the Cardi. Yeah, the Cardi was very boring. Yeah, this I think what separates this is that it's got quite a nice balanced sweetness to it. I think that's that's what. But I almost kind of crave bit. a bit of peat. You know, that's that's the weird thing now. I kind of want want to delve back into that cesspit. I mean, yeah, Smokehead was like <laughs> having five grams of smack as your introduction to heroin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's always going to be that afterglow. <laughs> A deep dark It's never going to get better, is it? <laughs> I know. I'd, 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 I mean, this is definitely a whiskey I would buy again just to have but around also, as something that's just... easy to drink, nice... Just to give uh, an idea of price, I think this is one of the cheapest ones we've purchased today. I think it came in at twenty one pounds or something like that. That is, that is, which the is one of the cheapest. That's that's a bargain. Which is it is a bargain for this. Uh, yeah, I think for a bottle of Scottish whiskey, seven cents of twenty one quid, you really can't go wrong. Mm. Well, you can go. Very <laughs> yeah, wrong. yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, for this you can't go too wrong. Yeah, no, this is yeah, it's really nice. It's it's easy drinking. Nothing. No highlight features, but, you know... See, it's interesting you say that the Talisker Sky is your favourite, because for me it's still the Penderin. Really? You like the... I, I don't know whether the sweet, I'm romanticizing Sweet Welsh it. number. Yeah. Okay, okay uh, let's move on to a different pace, uh, and we'll go on to a few more off-topical uh, and hopefully more fun questions. So I'm going to kick us off with our first question. So uh, as, um, as we know, Voltaire had a pen name. or oh, sorry, Voltaire was his pen name. And the interesting... So, Voltaire, uh, he changed his name while he served his prison sentence uh, in the Bastille. Francois-Marie Oroway. Oroway, yeah. It's, it's not, yeah. not so sexy, is it? And it's, supposedly... It's still quite sexy, even though it's got Marie in there. It's... <laughs> Francois-Oroway. Francois-Marie. Uh, when, when he Arouet. wrote this book, he didn't actually write it under his own name either. I'm not sure... Yeah, he... it, it was Dr. Something was uh, the pen name he, he wrote. And what's yeah. actually really interesting about this, it's one of the few books that, at the time, it was published in England, it was published f in France, it was published in, like, three other countries, all at the same time. That was really, really rare. Most yeah. of the times you'd publish it, it, it got success, it would then be translated. translated yeah. But Voltaire was such kind of a, a master publicist that he... And also, it stopped the book being banned. Yes, because if it's, in, if it's in one country, it can be translated back mm. to it, it's impossible to ban it. Yeah, so that was kind of cool in its own, it's, its own sense. And I remember, um, apparently, so there's a little bit of a dispute about where he got the name Voltaire from. So, uh, 
some say, or there's uh, argument to be made that it's just an anagram of letters of his name that he kind of put together and found a cool name. But then another story is that his sisters and his mother, when he was younger, called him Le Petit Volontaire, which means determined <laughs> little thing. <Aww. laughs> and he just played on that because, you know, he, I guess that's just how he saw himself for his entire life, just this determined little little boy challenging the nobility in the church. I mean, he's and... a real, you know, some people have mastery of the sword. This boy has mastery of the pen, doesn't he? Yeah. And he uses that mastery to really screw over as many people as he possibly can. I'd I love mean, to he's... know how long it took him to write this, Three actually. days. Mm-hmm. Three days? Yeah. For that's extraordinary. Hell. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I mean, what do you normally do in three days? You know, oh, jack shit, heavily. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, well, different type of masturbation, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Intellectual masturbation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's... Three days, really? I mean, That's it is a short exactly. short book, isn't it? It's 15,000 words. I mean, my dissertation was probably took five days, but... True, but... One day, maybe seven thousand years time, <laughs> when all other documents have been destroyed. Yeah, and it's... <laughs> apart from his pen drive, <laughs> oh, which yeah, I don't know where they'll we'll find that. What else have you got on that pen drive? That's the real question. Oh, some good shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back back to the question. Uh, yeah, what, what would be your pen name and why? It's a difficult one, isn't it? I need to pass over to the just yeah. creative mastery of Matthew here. I feel okay. like he's going to come up with something brilliant. Mm, and then we'll all have to retract after it. <sighs> okay, okay. so you expect me to come up with something that you can rip into and then add to. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> That's an open invitation. Yes. <laughs> so basically, just do what you naturally do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I would use, I'd use the pen name The Carpenter. Explain. The carpenter creates. The carpenter creates out of something natural. But is that a carpenter pen name? Muncher. That's more like a wrestling name. No, I, I think it'd be a good pen name. I mean, you could be anything, I suppose. I mean, I suppose you could, yeah. But isn't it normally a pen name like a, a real, name? more real, a real name? Yeah. So you could be John Carpenter. Or... It's a hard one, isn't it? I'd probably go Willy Weasel. And you know, do kids' novels. <laughs> 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 Just because that would be hilarious with, with the name Willy Weasel, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I, I think it's 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 really and also how pretentious do you have to be to have a, a pen name in this day and age? Like, I completely get where Voltaire's coming from, where if you publish it under a different name, the government might not put you in jail. I I honestly think in five no no in twenty years time people will be using pen names again. I'm people sure of it. people still do use pen names. All yeah, I mean, uh, J.K. Rowling used that pen name, didn't she, to yeah. publish her last book? And there's even did she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's even well-known authors who use pen names because well, they Virginia don't Woolf. Want the... well, no, was it Virginia? No, what's Pride and Prejudice and Virginia Woolf? I think used pen names, didn't they? Jane Austen. Pride and Prejudice. I think... Jane Austen. Yeah, didn't she use a pen name? Yeah, but that was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, but again, again yeah. yeah. Sorry. Um, but I know as some authors do, but a lot of them, a lot of quite a few successful authors do when they want to write a very different type of book because they don't want the preconceptions of it's a good you know, idea what, what their name brings to come into their new novel um yeah so that the, the question really is if when you create a pen name is what preconceptions do you want to have or not want to have so for example if you're writing a novel about something uh which is maybe uh talking about political, you know, faux pas about society, you might not want to have a name which is British and masculine. You might want to have a name which is feminine and sounds foreign. You might want to do that. Yeah, no, I, I suppose, yeah. I mean, that that's if you legitimise the argument that you have a different ground of opinion based on the sexuality or ethnicity that you are, which I think... I, in, in I, it, I honestly think people judge people of, of course they do I mean that's the whole point of racism isn't that the people judge people on their name or on their background so yeah it, it does it's make prejudice, sense prejudice yeah. I, I think I'd choose a pen name based on I'd imagine I was someone who'd grown up in Alabama in the countryside Little John and try and think of something that I thought was fancy like Gustave Petitpois or something <laughs> <laughs> I would choose something like that so, you know, what type of novel do you think you're writing? Um, 
Uh, why slave owners were victimised. In- <laughs> <laughs> it was about states' rights. <laughs> Next question. Where would the modern day Candide be set and why? Well, for me, Candide is like the ultimate gap yard story. He is, you know, he's met this lovely woman who we can't pronounce her name, so let's just call her Wonderful Woman He Meets in a Bar. And he meets Wonderful Woman in a Bar, and he's trying to travel around the whole of the world trying to find her. That is how it would work. From hostile to hostile. Uh, yeah, he goes to Paraguay. In search of. No, Paraguay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is, that is pretty good. Found this great bar called El Dorado. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it has to be the Middle East with this one because there's so much conflict. You know, like there's, there's that chance of things you're going, going from really... conflict to conflict to conflict to conflict. You know, and, and there, there's com- combination of religious tension in all these places. You know, massive difference in hierarchy and strata. I mean, obviously these these are concepts that are also familiar in Western Europe and America. But I don't know. I think if well, you're... Europe's far too stable for him to be having yeah, the same sort of dialogue. Yeah, you know, if you're now. talking about like people getting their hands chopped off and stuff like that, I think if you are really setting it to kind of view the world in it, how ideologies may sometimes go wrong. Okay, so instead of the religious... Moroccan pirates, you maybe have the Somalian pirates. Instead. Yeah, exactly. I think he's he would just be on a night out in London. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what it's he's trying to. Bars. I think, and enough multiculturalism. He's he's travelling all around because you know he 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 needs to get exposure to these countries, which were otherwise relatively quite separated in the 18th century. Just go on a night out in London, and you'll come across French That'd people, be quite, they, they South could, Americans. They, they could redo the Turkish. whole Candide book as in one night out yeah. in London. Yeah, from like nine yeah. different bars. You know, can you yeah. call them Constantinople? Yeah, El Dorado. <laughs> That could actually be fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> In yeah. the end, he gr- he goes to Shropshire again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's, uh, I've had enough. Know, not not well, Shropshire, that's... sorry. <laughs> that is the hangover, isn't it, really? <laughs> it's just him in Kew Gardens. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Sir, you have to leave. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I've planted my crops. <laughs> I'm just going to garden from now on. <laughs> so you do not have a job here. <laughs> Okay, so uh, quick far round. Uh, which actor, modern or or or, or, or past, uh, would you choose to play Candide? Michael Sarah. Who's he? You must know Michael Sarah. Give me a few as a not uh, for his films from. Um... Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> you must know Michael. Oh, you know? <laughs> which film which, are you asking, Luke? Who is he? Uh, yeah. Do you know? Yeah, yeah, Arrested Development. Oh, that guy. Uh, he, he also, always plays the He also did Social character. Network. No, but he, I always get him confused. He didn't do Social Network. Him and, Zo- you know, Zombieland guy. Yeah. yeah. Yes. They look exactly... Uh, oh, that, yeah. Is, is he from... He's not the Zombieland guy. He's not they, the Zombieland they guy. They look exactly the same. Yeah, Michael Cera would be brilliant. Go. He always plays what? the yeah. same... What's happened? Kind of, well, mainly plays the same kind of anxious, naive character. But tongue in cheek Just a bit of an time. idiot. Yeah, yeah that is a, that's a good one. Matt, have you got any, got any names to put in the hat? Well, I I just think it'd be more comical if it was Louis Theroux going around, just into these you know awful situations and going, oh, let me talk about your situation. And then him getting mugged off and not really caring. That's, that's me for Louis I, Theroux. But I think there's a dark edge to Louis. Like, you know, he knows... Like he is, he is not. He is asking these questions to get a response. He's not. He already has a set opinion, but the, he knows that the only way he can get through to these people is if he is like so cynically nice that he will actually get through to them. Plus, I don't think Louis III could get mugged off. He's he's got brass balls. Yeah, he is a bad. That's fucking the one. The Which one, one? Where I realised. No, there's there's one in particular where I realised how fucking balls he is when he went and met those far right anti the the anti Semites. Oh yeah, I know. And they started. This is US. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they started. Um, he said he turned around to them and went, "Oh, so what would you do if I told you I was Jewish?" And he's like on their property, just with his cameraman and his sound guy. Yeah, they're there having a barbecue. There's a big group of Nazis <laughs> around him, basically, and they're like. 
well, are you Jewish? And he just starts going, I refuse to answer that question. <sighs> and it's brass fucking yeah. balls. I mean, and, and also, they balls. are so like, ah, <laughs> oh, you look Jewish. You know, you yeah. scumbag. Like, you know, all like, of what this. does it matter? He just goes, what does it matter? What does it matter? I don't want to answer that question. That if is that was me, I'd courageous. Have oh, I'd have caved in to him. You're in here. <laughs> Your trousers would be down. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm circumcised, so I would not have done that. <laughs> 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 if they were like let's look at your dick I would have gone now, how far can I run for yeah. how long <laughs> <laughs> you're so lanky the wind would have just caught you and you floated out that would have been my strategy <laughs> <laughs> okay what about your actor I think I'd go at Johnny Depp Oh, okay. because you know, I want to like Johnny uh, Depp's too dark. No, I want an over want the top, a bit smoky. Yeah, you know, a, a bit kind of like a n- nuanced portrayal of Candide. Yeah. Who would be a good Pangloss? Do we think? I'm kind of building out this film in my head now. Yeah, yeah. it's got to be an all-star cast. Yeah, I'm imagining it like the Marvel poster for Infinity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're all there, layered over each other dramatically. Pangloss is a hard one because no no serious actor would want to be Pangloss. Like you know, you ca- you can't go to a like sit in McKell and be like, oh, do you want to be the bumbling idiot who is retarded? <laughs> like no, I'd rather be Gandalf, please. <laughs> so what actor do we think would accept a role for being bumblingly retarded? What, what, what is the guy in the American Office? Uh... <laughs> Steve Carell. Yeah, Steve Carell. <laughs> No, everything's good. Everything's good. Yeah, <laughs> being hanged like uh, Seth I Rogen. Think this would have... Oh, Seth Rogen. Yeah, he accepts anything. Yeah, <laughs> and he would play the character perfectly. Oh, oh Pangloss, my. Uh... Or Will Ferrell. Yeah, Will Ferrell. Yeah, Will Ferrell. My friends have just died. <laughs> Will Ferrell. <laughs> Will Ferrell is Candide. So... <laughs> He'd be like hanged, and it would even be funny. <laughs> yeah, Will Ferrell is Candide. Expressions. It'd be like a re reimagination of Elf, wouldn't it? <laughs> okay, well, I think that was a fantastic question. I um, know, for some reason, in my head, just thinking of Jerry Seinfeld being involved. Oh yeah, Larry, Larry <laughs> David would be Martin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and for tonight's, I'm sure everyone is highly sad about this, but this is tonight's last question, and it, it's quite poignant, I, I, I believe. Uh, and it is if Voltaire. Oh, I haven't been recording. Oh, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> well, we've got another seven questions to go then. <laughs> uh, if Voltaire was going to create a podcast, what would the podcast be about? And that, folks, is the end of tonight's show. Uh, we thank you very much for listening. And we note that we will be back in a month's time to review Murakami's Kafka on the Shore. Thank you. Good night. And read well.